the ladle tale Matthew Pryor and the septics think twas long ago since gods came down incognito to see who were their friends or foes, and how our actions fell or rose. That since they gave things their beginning, and set this world a jig is spinning, supine they in their heaven remain, exempt from passion and from pain, and frankly leave us human elves to cut and shuffle for ourselves. To stand or walk, to rise or tumble, as matter and as motion jumble. The poets now, and painters, hold this thesis both absurd and bold, and your good-natured gods, they say, dissent some twice or thrice a day, else all these things we toil so hard and would not avail one single farthing. For when the hero we rehearse to grace his actions in our verse, tis not by dint of human thought that to his latium he is brought. Iris descends by fate's commands to guide his steps through foreign lands, and Amphitrite clears his way from rocks and quicksands in the sea. And if you see him in a sketch, though drawn by Apollo or Carrick, he shows not half his force and strength strutting in armor and at length. That he may make his proper figure the piece must yet be four yards bigger. The nymphs conduct him to the field, one holds his sword, and one his shield, Mars, standing by, asserts his quarrel and fame flies after with a laurel. These points, I say, of speculation, as t'were to save our single nation, men idly learned will dispute, assert, object, confirm, refute. Each mighty angry, mighty right, with equal arms sustains the fight, till now no umpire can agree him, so both draw off and sing te doom. Is it an equilibrio if deities descend or no? Then let this affirmative prevail as requisite to form my tale. For by all parties tis confessed that those opinions are the best which in their nature most conduce to present ends and private use. Two gods came, therefore, from above, one Mercury, the other Jove. The humor was, it seems, to know if all the favors they bestow could from our own perverseness ease us, and if our wish enjoyed would please us, discoursing largely on this theme, o'er hills and dales their godships came till well nigh tired, at almost night, they thought it proper to alight. Not here, that it is true as odd is, that in disguise a god or goddess exerts no supernatural powers, but acts on maxims much like ours. They spied at last a country farm, where all was snug, and clean, and warm. For woods before and hills behind secured it both from rain and wind, large oxen in the field were lowing, good grain was sowed, good fruit was growing of last year's corn and barn's great store. Fat turkeys gobbling at the door. And wealth in short, with peace consented that people here should live contented. But did they in effect do so? Have patience friend, and thou shalt know. The honest farmer and his wife, two years declined from prime of life, had struggled with the marriage news, as almost every couple does, sometimes my plague. Sometimes my darling. Kissing today? tomorrow snarling, jointly submitting to endure that evil which admits no cure. Our gods the outward gates unbarred. Our farmer met them in the yard. Thought they were folks that lost their way, and asked them civilly to stay. Told them for supper or for bed they might go on and be worse sped. So said, so done. The gods consent, all three into the parlor went, they compliment, they sit, they chat. Fight o'er the wars, reform the state. A thousand naughty points they clear, till supper and my wife appear. Jove made his leg, and kissed the dame. Obsequious Hermes did the same. Jove kissed the farmer's wife, you say. He did, but in an honest way, oh. Not with half that warmth and life with which he kissed Amphitryon's wife. Well, then, things handsomely were served. My mistress for the strangers carved. How strong the beer, how good the meat. How loud they laughed, how much they eat, in epic sumptuous would appear, yet shall be passed in silence here. For I should grieve to have it said that, by a fine description led, I made my episode too long, or tired my friend to grace my song. The great cup served, the cloth away, Jove thought it time to show his play. Landlord and landlady, he cried, folly and jesting laid aside, that ye thus hospitably live, and strangers with good cheer receive is mighty grateful to your betters and make ye and gods themselves your debtors. To give this thesis plainer proof, you have tonight beneath your roof a pair of gods, nay, never wonder, this youth can fly and I can thunder. I'm Jupiter, 
and he Mercurius, my page, my son indeed, but spurious. Form, then, three wishes, you and madam, and, sure as you already had em, the things desired in half an hour shall all be here and in your power. Thank ye, great gods, the woman says. Oh, may your altars ever blaze. A ladle for our silver dish is what I want, is what I wish. A ladle. Cries the man, a ladle. O oh, dukes, Corsica, you have prayed ill. What should be great you turn to farce, I wish the ladle in your asterisk. With equal grief and shame my muse the sequel of the tale pursues. The ladle fell into the room, and struck an old Corsica's bum. Our couple weep two wishes past, and kindly joined to form the last. To ease the woman's awkward pain, and get the ladle out again. Moral. This commoner has worth and parts, is praised for arms, or loved for arts. His head aches for a coronet, and who is blessed that is not great? Some sense and more state kind heaven to this well lauded peer has given, what then? He must have rule and sway, and all is wrong till he's in play. The miser must make up his plum, and dares not touch the hoarded sum. The sickly dotard wants a wife to draw off his last drags of life. Against our peace we are my will. Amidst our plenty something still for horses, houses, pictures, planting, to thee, to me, to him, is wanting. That cruel something unpossessed, corrodes, and leavens all the rest. That something if we could obtain would soon create a future pain. And to the coffin from the cradle tis all a wish and all a ladle.